We are 5,000 strong, as I write, our numbers swelling every day. And word has come to us that Roose Bolton moves towards Winterfell with all his power, there to wed his bastard to your half-sister. He must not be allowed to restore the castle to its former strength. We march against him. Arnold Karstark and Moore's Umber will join us. I will save your sister if I can, and find a better match for her than Ramsay Snow. You and your brothers must hold the wall until I can return. Letter from Stannis to Jon Snow. In an epic series filled with surprises, plot twists, and defiance of convention, there is little we can predict with certainty. One item on that short list is Windsor. We knew it was coming. The Starks told us, after all. We had glimpses of it throughout the earlier books, especially at and beyond the wall, but also in dreams that oft seemed prophetic. Sure enough, by the end of A Dance of Dragons, there is a massive, long-running storm. Another certainty in A Song of Ice and Fire is war. We have certainly not seen the last pitched battle. With those two items in mind, does it follow that we should see a pitched battle in winter? <laughs> the Battle of Ice is just that. A struggle in which resources are scarce, the cold is literally enough to kill, and time is on no one's side. Winter has just begun, after all, and we know what the next book is entitled. Before we can dream of spring, we must brave the winds of winter. Well, not we, them. <laughs> the armies of two extremely formidable and determined men, Stannis Baratheon and Roose Bolton, facing off while a ridiculous winter storm rages. This three-part series goes beyond a single battle, however. Even our love of detail is not enough to make three episodes out of just that. <laughs> We're dealing with a campaign for the North, and it has major implications for the plot, and so for many of our favorite characters, and least favorite, you know, the Freys. <laughs> hey, now, I know lots of Frey fans. What, in part what You do? All right, well, we won't say their names out loud, uh, because it puts them at risk. Anyone who is a Frey fan is, uh, you know... <laughs> in danger. <laughs> in part, so here in part one, we'll explore the motivations and goals of the various players in the North, what they want, which side they're on, who they want to kill, how much, and how they'll accomplish any of this without freezing. <laughs> so hello and welcome to another episode of History of Westeros podcast, podcast dedicated to George R.R. Mar R. R. Martin's uh, Song of Ice and Fire book series, as well as HBO's Game of Thrones. This episode, um, as you can tell by the title, um, utilizes the Winds of Winter, um, specifically the Theon spoiler chapter. So um, I, sh I really hope you haven't been listening this whole time if you don't want spoilers, but turn <laughs> it off now if you don't want spoilers. We've got a lot to talk about here in part one. In addition to Roos and Stannis, their strengths, weaknesses, and ambitions, we have all the northern houses, including, but not limited to, Manderly, Karstark, Mormont, Umber. Also we have the Fierce Mountain Clans, Kingsmen, Queensmen, Freys, Ramsay, Asha, Theon, Rickon, and Davos. And speaking of those two, there are secrets in play that hover over everything. Uh, who knows what that Rickon lives, for example, and what might happen if the North learns that he and Bran are alive. Who knows that it was Ramsay and not Theon that killed Winterfell. They killed Winterfell. <laughs> <laughs> Destroyed Winterfell. And, yeah. uh, or the Ironborn, rather. Who knows what the hell Stannis is going to do to win this battle? Only George, of course, but we've got a lot of ideas. The name Battle of Ice derives in large part from how A Dance with Dragons was edited. The book wasn't supposed to have all of those cliffhangers, and two major battles set for the end of A Dance with Dragons were pushed to the Winds of Winter. They were nicknamed the Battle of Fire and the Battle of Ice. In preparing this episode, we utilized a number of sources other than ourselves, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the main contributor uh, from a, uh, a source material uh, point of view is our friend Bran Vross, whose Winterfell Below is very excellent uh, set of analysis on more than just what we're dealing with today, also the situation inside Winterfell, as well as the battle and a lot of the politics that lead up to it. So thanks to him for a great resource. You'll find links to his website on our page and in the links to this video. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we have a special guest today who will be part w with us for all three of these episodes and perhaps some future episodes uh, that we have in the pipeline. Uh, welcome, everybody, Jeff Hartline. Hey, guys. My name is Jeff Hartline. I'm also known as Brendan Beefish. I'm the founder of the blog Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire. I'm also one of the moderators for the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit. I'm uh, pretty thrilled to be here, mm -hmm. all things considered. Did a lot of research for this, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, we certainly have. Uh, we're certainly happy to have you, Jeff. And we've both of us had read a lot of your uh, work before we worked on this together. So we were we knew it would be a great addition and a great uh, thing to do for everybody. I'm sure a lot of you guys out there have had no Jeff from before seeing him on our videos. So, mm -hmm. and if you uh, didn't, you should check it out. That's right. So. 
Uh, uh, before we get started, a, c a couple of uh, thank yous to recent donators. Uh, it's a great way to support the show and to help keep us going. Um, on our website, you can go to www.historyofwesteros.com, click the donate button, get your name mentioned on the show, and help us create more episodes. Uh, first of all, Marsha R. and Ben M., Roderick C., oh. Joseph I., I'm sorry? Roderick C. Yeah, Roderick C. That's right. That's a good one, huh? <laughs> That's a very, uh, very Game of Thrones name you got there, Roderick. Uh, Robert G., James S., a Douglas S., Tallahassee friend there, Latoya K., James T., Cody Johnson again, of course, Stephen H., Blake G., and Ramsey K. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. You really, uh, guys and gals, you really help uh, keep us going, and uh, mm -hmm. we appreciate uh, anything you guys can do for us. So... Moving on, we've got a lot to talk about today. Some of you may have been expecting our Sons of the Dragon episode, but uh, that one has gone the way of so many other episodes. We've gotten uh, some advanced information on World of Ice and Fire that just, it's just become clear there's going to be a lot on Andy's and Magor in World of Ice and Fire, and we're just going to, it just doesn't make sense to do that episode yet. We've got that a lot said. of it done. Yeah, that said, a lot of it is done already. So when the World of Ice and Fire comes out, let me tell you, we are going to have so many topics that we can attack. It's only going to be a matter of what to do first. And so, so many of them, excited. we're already going to have half the legwork done already. Right. So you should expect some pretty quick episodes once it comes out. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, of course, like we said, this is a three-part episode, so there will be the next two parts of this before uh, World of Ice and Fire, as well as we're working on some uh, the Road Prince and Princess and the Queen and all that. So Hopefully we can get to that out before the World of Ice and Fire. Those are the well. next most likely things be, to come I out before can, but yeah. uh, the World of Ice and Fire. So, uh, anyways. Let's get on with this, though. Uh, we've got, of course, the one thing we'd like to do to approach the material is to keep it in uh, book format as much as possible, and, and rather understanding where this information is coming from. So we're going to talk just briefly about who the relevant point of views and perspectives are. Of course, we have everyone's favorite bastard, Jon Snow. Beyond in the persona of Reek, well, at least half the time. <laughs> yeah, he's he got all those different names, right? <laughs> we have everyone's favorite uh, Onion Knight, Davos Seaworth. Of course. And we also have Asha Greyjoy, who... Uh, I guess that's a lot of people's favorite Greyjoy. Sure, why not? <laughs> that's true. I, I would. I, that's probably true. I'll just say that. I'll just throw that. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> it's or not. She's just, everyone's favorite Greyjoy, and if Theon or Victorian or Euron are your favorites, well, you're wrong. <laughs> he said it. Uh. <laughs> so the Battle of Ice and surrounding campaign is. It boils down to Stannis versus Roos, and the stakes are very high, as we'll see. We mentioned the time is, for the most part, not on anyone's side, and that's even if you don't include the weather. <laughs> there are a lot of reasons why we say this, and we'll touch on them all throughout this episode. First of all, Roose Bolton's hold on the North is only as strong as a piece of paper Tommen signed, naming him to the Wardenship of the North. That's about the extent of the support he can expect to receive from the Iron Throne. They aren't sending troops or money despite the presence of Stannis. He has to consolidate his hold on political power and eliminate this threat of Stannis all by himself. So Roos has a lot to juggle, but he's quite capable, has plenty of soldiers and allies, and he has plenty of moves he can make. For one, he knows legitimacy in the North runs through Winterfell. A perfect place to start. First of all, why Winterfell? Until midway through A Dance with Dragons, the castle of Winterfell is a burned husk uh, of what the Starks, uh, of what it was when the Starks ruled it, rather. So what makes it crucial, uh, how can a burned-out husk of a castle be so important? It's, it really all comes down to the simple case of optics. Winterfell holds supreme symbolic importance to anyone who holds it. So as King's Landing is to claiming dominion over Westeros, or Casterly Rock is the Alpha to, of the West, Winterfell is the heart of the North. People aren't going to forget that the Starks have ruled most of the North for over a thousand years, and have ruled Winterfell and the surrounding area for a, perhaps 8,000 or so years. So generation upon generation of Northmen were ruled by the Starks. It's a constant and almost religious concept that the Starks have a mandate to rule. And at the very least, recent memory is favorable to the Starks, as the Little tells us. When there was a Stark in Winterfell, a maiden girl could walk the King's Road in her name-day gown and still go unmolested. And travelers could find fire, bread, and salt at many an inn and hold fast. But the nights are colder now, and doors are closed. There's squids in the wolf's wood and flayed men ride the king's road asking after strangers. Since this north is so accustomed to Stark rule, the marriage to fake Arya 
is a must for the Boltons. They need to hone in on that legitimacy. And the marriage needs to be conducted in Winterfell. If the Dread Four and the Starks are to be united, uh, it becomes difficult to oppose the Flayed Man without also doing harm to the Direwolf. The idea being there will still be a Stark in Winterfell, even though this person has a Bolton father. <laughs> the idea, of course, being that Ramsay will father a child on fake Arya. <laughs> Now, of course, there's a lot of reasons why this probably won't happen, but this is the idea. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, Lord Bolton is keenly aware that Winterfell and Arya's symbolism will lure Stannis to Winterfell. So yeah, it's kind of a, a tactical or strategic reason militarily to lure him there. And, you know, it shows that when Stannis starts to gain momentum, Roos moves from Barrowden to Winterfell and sets about repairing it. It's one of those, you know, I know, I know what he knows types of situations. And Roos kind of explains it a little bit better than I can. Even ruined and broken, Winterfell remains Lady Arya's home. What better place to wed her, bed her, and stake her claim? Or stake your claim. <laughs> that is only half of it, however. We would be fools to march on Stannis. Let Stannis march on us. He is too cautious to come to Barrington, but he must come to Winterfell. And it bears mention that much of Winterfell wasn't actually destroyed by, by the Boltons, or by Ramsay Bolton. Many of the walls and stone structures will be a little worse for the wear. I mean, fire can't take out stone necessarily. In addition, the godswood and the ancient heart tree were not burned, and they still remain in Winterfell, in and around Winterfell, rather. So Roos has the place fixed up. He puts all the squatters he finds already on the site there to work, and then he rewards them by hanging them. <laughs> then he settles in with his big army, marries his son to fake Arya Stark, and waits for Stannis. And, you know, it's a little funny to me that uh, Ramsay destroyed Winterfell, and Roos is fixing it up. Dad's always <laughs> cleaning up uh, little boys' messes there. <laughs> <laughs> So, meanwhile, Stannis, as a non-Northman, realizes that he has to gain legitimacy, and as a claimant to the throne, he needs soldiers. He's running pretty low on those. He sets out to accomplish both of these by following the policy he adopted as soon as he came to the Wall. He explains it himself. Lord Seaworth is a man of humble birth, but he reminded me of my duty, when all I could think of was my rights. I had the cart before the horse, Davos said. I was trying to win the throne to save the kingdom, when I should have been trying to save the kingdom to win the throne. Now, since people aren't exactly tripping over themselves to in haste to support Stannis, he has to prove himself. He says, Without a son of Winterfell to stand beside me, I can only hope to win the battle, the North by battle. That requires stealing a leaf from my brother's book. Not that Robert ever read one. <laughs> I must deal my foes a mortal blow before they know that I am on them. And defeating, so defeating the wildlings of the Wall was not really enough to garner the loyalty of the Northmen in general. <laughs> But it, it definitely helped his case. Yeah, some at least took note of Stannis, at least considered joining him, but he was still perceived as relatively weak. Uh, Blackwater was a famous defeat and still in people's minds, and really few people are willing to take on Bolton, who's <laughs> simply too powerful and really who wants Roos as an enemy. Well, the Mountain Clans do, for one. Mm -hmm. He's got, uh, so for Stannis, he got a major infusion of soldiers from them. Uh, he needed other enemies to fight before taking on the Boltons, however, in order to prove himself, and taking on Bolton right away was a little more than he could, he could handle right at first. So it just so happens, though, that the North is infested with Iron Men. So mm -hmm. John gives him some very strong advice on how to make use of that situation. John glanced down at the map. Deepwood Mott, he tapped it with the finger. If Bolton means to fight the Iron Men, so must you. Deepwood is a moat in Bailey Castle in the midst of a thick forest easy to creep up on unawares. So the win at Deepwood Mott won him the support of House Glover. It was their castle, after all. <laughs> that would be kind of ungrateful of them to not uh, be <laughs> happy about that. It also won him the support of nearby House Mormont. Uh, so the plan is working so far, it would seem. With that in mind, he knows that taking Winterfell and defeating Bolton would seal the deal, especially if he rescues Arya and restores House Stark, who are so loved. <laughs> what better way to show his worth as Defender of the Realm than by restoring the greatest stabilizing force the North knows? Thus, rescuing Arya Stark has, ba has major benefits to his cause. As far as Stannis knows, she's the only Stark out there. If he succeeds, he further demonstrates his quality to the North. Stannis realizes this and is determined and in a hurry. The Roos also kind of knows this is what well, all of this as well, and he tells our and he tells Ramsay something interesting along the way. His clansmen will not abandon the daughter of their precious Ned to such as you. Of course, this is directed at Ramsay. <laughs> Stannis must march or lose them. In other words, though Stannis's plan is working, Roos's plan is working as well, at least initially and early on. 
<laughs> he's manipulated events so that he gets to sit tight in a fortified place, being Winterfell, or Baradun first and then Winterfell. Mm -hmm. And then his opponent is has to attack him. He's politically compelled to do that. But let's not be fooled how, by how easily Theon took Winterfell. It was practically empty then. As we remember, Roger Cassell took most of the soldiers with him to confront, well, Ramsay, I guess. <laughs> or no, it actually was Dagmar Clefjaw down in um, right, Dagmar Dagmar Square. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now it's packed full of soldiers. Mm -hmm. Though, as we'll see, uh, not all of them are loyal to House Bolton. Uh, what is Stannis going to do? Taking Winterfell is easier said than done. So what we'll have more on that potential battle at Winterfell in part three of this three-part series. Right. Yeah, but for now we have the, ma the first major battle of the campaign, which may precede an incredibly dangerous attack on Winterfell. But what's interesting is despite that so-called incredible danger, Stannis has Northerners lining up to help him do this. Why is that? <laughs> Let's discuss the political situation in the North. That starts with House Stark, who of course are central to everything despite them being so powerless right now. Stannis and Roos are both using the Stark name and lineage to their advantage. Everyone thinks that the Stark kids are dead now, or married at the Wall, as in the case of Jon Snow, or married to imps, such as <laughs> Dawson Stark. For the most part, this is untrue, of course, but we have to keep in mind what the characters know and separate that from what we know as readers. The public-slash-common view is that Bran and Rickon are dead, at the hand of Theon, who also destroyed Winterfell, and that Sansa is not only married to the imp, but fled for Kingsling. So, and a lot, a lot of people consider her out of the picture. So when Roose produces an, an Arya, she's good <laughs> enough. Any Stark will do. Some will question whether she's real or not, but not really out loud. Which makes it especially unclear which houses are even aware that Arya is fake, because surely some of them know. Right. But since they can't really talk about it, it's hard for us to figure that out, except for Inferl. But, uh, certain houses that are cl really close by, like, say, House Serwin, who we'll talk about a bit more later, they should know. They're only a half day's ride from Winterfell, and, and they deal with each other constantly. So you'd think that they'd be one to know. But as we'll see throughout the episode, there's reasons why they can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. but, but there is kind of one person who knows for sure, and the person who knows this is a bit shocking. It just so happens that a man with another Stark in hand, Littlefinger, Ramsay says to fake Arya, I was told you'd know how to please a man. Was that a lie? N no, my lord. I was trained. <laughs> you see, it was Littlefinger, after all, who took care of her, that being Jane Poole, after Lord Eddard's household was slaughtered. Jane was the steward's daughter. She was allowed to stay with Sansa during the carnage, and Lord Baelish took her after that. Hmm. Try not to think about you know, where and how Jane was trained by mm. Littlefinger? Hmm. Ugh. Eef. <laughs> yeah, not, not good at all. But no. little, so, little, so Littlefinger might have something, have a little something on Roos. But in the game of who has the best star, Stannis <laughs> may soon have one that trumps the others. We know that Manderly has Davos looking for Rickon, but also in addition to that, House Little, a uh, northern, uh, northern mountain clan, likely knows that Bran is alive as Bran and company encountered a little in a, so in a storm of sorts. As a reminder, this is the scene where they spend the night in the cave with the friendly stranger, gives them oat cakes, blood sausages, and ale. He talks as if he knows who they are, but doesn't say their names. Uh, he's deferring to them, and you know, he's like, look, just go on your way. Uh, you know. He points out that the Boltons are looking for these same boys with wolves, clearly them, but he doesn't turn them in, so he's clearly on their side. It was him who gave that quote about a, a girl can walk around in her, in her what, birthday suit, name day suit. Right. Name day gown. I didn't get, by the way, the first time I read that, that it was that name day gown meant uh, nude. I, I thought that like it was, I, I, it was as good as nude, but I was like picturing like a tiny gown, like stretch. It was weird. He's explained it to me the other day. Uh, so the little points out that the Boltons are looking for these boys, and by not turning them in, he clearly shows what side he's on. Uh, but there's another thing entirely. Rob's will could trump. Bran, Rickon, probably not, but it's just a whole other thing to throw in the middle of everything. They make it more complicated. Yeah, but he didn't know Rickon was alive when he wrote it, that being like, Rob. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Or Bran, for that matter. I mean, he thinks that they're all, they were all killed at Winterfell by Theon. Yeah. Um, and Arya, too, yeah. Arya, yeah, Arya's been missing for you know, a couple of years, I mean, a, a year or so plus since uh, Eddard's arrest in, the, in A Game of Thrones. So when Rob writes the will, he doesn't know that any, any of his siblings are alive at that point, besides John. In fact, in fact he, I remember him saying to, to Catelyn, you know, why do you fool yourself? Arya's dead. We haven't heard from her. He's just trying He's trying to convince Catelyn that 
mm-hmm. she should accept that Arya's dead. So yeah, they, they think the, she's dead. The bearers <laughs> of the will might even learn of Rickon before they deliver them their news to Jon. That's or true, they, too. Yeah. Or they could hear that Jon is dead and not make the, make the journey to him at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how information flows. It's so, see how important it is to keep... We, it's, what we know as readers is so much different than what the characters know, and there's mm-hmm. so many characters that know so many different things. Yeah. I don't know how... I don't know how... Any of us keep track of this, even us. <laughs> I, I, but I mean, the thing is, like, the will just has so many possi- too many possibilities for this episode. I mean, we could talk about it to death, mm-hmm. essentially, but we're not gonna. We can't really. I mean, we can try going really d- deep into it, but I think it would just be kind of an impossible task, kind of a rabbit hole for us today. Yeah, it's it's a little too much of a off the topic. Uh, even though it's rel- related, relevant, it's it's its own whole ball of wax. So, right. But, I mean, like, after all, though, it isn't just about Stannis and Roos and the possible Stark restoration. Right. So we'll, we're, we're going to break down throughout this episode various players and pawns, what each of them care about, what they want to accomplish, who they want to kill. That's always a big one, right? Mm, yeah. And once you understand all of this, it won't be quite as confusing. It'll, it'll help enhance your enjoyment of T- The Winds of Winter and any subsequent reweeds of the series. Did I say reweeds? <laughs> reweeds of the series. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, uh, yeah, here but, I'm trying to help straighten things out, and I can't even pronounce words. Yes. Oh, that's all right. Uh, before <laughs> looking at uh, the individual houses, we're going to look at the big picture. Uh, to start, Lee Dustin reminds us how things are in general. The Northmen, they fear the Dreadfort, but they love the Stark. Why do I keep doing all the female voices? <laughs> I did that on purpose. We know what that means. Stannis himself told us the difference between rule by love and rule by fear way back in A Clash of Kings. Ah, I get to do Stannis now. Okay. Men do not love me as they loved my brothers. They follow me because they fear me, and defeat is death to fear. It's a good so, Stannis voice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Aziz Ahai. Aziz Ahai. Aziz Aziz Ahai, I like that. (laughs) Thus we see the first of what will be many important similarities between Stannis and Roos, that they rule through fear and respect, and that they're both keenly aware that they're seen this way. They both know how they're perceived by others, and they they both play to these, uh, these advantages. Defeat is death to fear, Stannis says. This is why both of the commanders are cautious, and cautious almost to a fault. A single loss goes well beyond accounting for how many soldiers were slain or which strategic locations were lost. Defeat means significant desertions and loss of political significance, which means new allies are unlikely. Keeping that in mind really amps up how important that any and all potential battles will be. We have a king and a great lord facing off, two very major and powerful characters, and neither can afford to lose, but one of them will. Justin Massey agrees with this. Bruce Bolton is feared, but little loved. And his friends, the phrase? The North has not forgotten the Red Wedding. Every lord at Winterfell lost kinsmen there. Stannis need only bloody Bolton, and the Northmen will abandon him. See, one of the interesting things about uh, Stannis' brother, Robert, is that men would follow him even after a loss. I mean, you have the, was it the Battle of, uh, one of the battles in the war... And not, Ash, 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 yeah, one of the battles early in the, in the War of the Five, or not the War of the Five Kings, but Robert's Rebellion, where he took a loss, uh, and then he kept kept on moving. And that's really love, and that's almost entirely due to love, and that's real yeah. loyalty as well. The kind that gets kicked kicked around, <laughs> the guy, the kind of king that gets, gets kicked around during disappointment, despair, and whatever. But the thing is, neither Roos nor Stannis are well-loved. It's likewise as simple. One could easily make the case that love is a somewhat alien concept to them both. They neither give nor receive it for the most part. But fear and respect, they've got lots of that. What they do not have is lots of time. Two examples of uh, time not being on Roos's side are revealed when he's speaking to Ramsay. The first... Lord Stannis has taken Deepwood Mott from the Iron Men and re- restored it to the House Glover. Worse, the mountain, gl- the mountain clans have joined him, Wool and Nori and Little and the rest. His strength is growing. Ours is greater. Now it is. <laughs> and the second... We appear strong for the moment, yes. We have powerful friends in the Lannisters and Freys and the grudging support of much of the North. But what do you imagine is going to happen when one of Ned Stark's sons turns up? So the pressure is pretty considerable for Roos. He knows the North doesn't love Stannis, but for many, the Pretender is the lesser of two evils, since they don't love Roos either. 
However, he also knows that without Stannis or a Stark to rally to, the North at large will have no choice but to accept Dreadfort rule. It would It's a lot like winning by default. If he can just get rid of all the other potential claimants to the North, they'll just have to accept Roos as much as they hate him. Yeah, and so the plan is thus, hurry up and take care of Stannis so he can concentrate on hunting down Bran and Rickon and or laying plans to deal with them when they appear. He has to consolidate his power base, essentially. Yeah, anything that allows for that default win. <laughs> it's a little funny, by the way, that Bruce's plan to hurry up <laughs> is to sit and wait for Stannis. <laughs> <laughs> hurry, hurry up and wait. Hurry up, exactly, <laughs> hurry up and wait. Uh, in addition to the things he knows to be concerned about, though, Roos has some other things he doesn't know about that he would be concerned about if he knew. Uh, and some of these he actually could know about, and we maybe just don't know that he knows. But we can make some strong assumptions here. Uh, one, of course, is Rob's will itself. Um, but for the most part, everyone is fighting for Stannis or Roos. But they have very different reasons why. Uh, it's kind of like there's these two major powers, and everyone pretty much has to pick a side, even though for a lot of people, they don't like either side. But right. you can't just be caught in the middle, so you got to pick somebody. Uh, so we're going to break down all these complicated back and forths and who's fighting for who and why. It's all, it is complicated, like I said, but it's also really fun. So uh, we'll start with Stannis and his allies and mm -hmm. go from there. So after the da after the disaster at Blackwater, most of Stannis' stormlords and Reach support deserted him. Those who stayed true to Stannis likely did so for two reasons: either feudal loyalty or adherence to Relor. The ones that followed Stannis due to feudal obligation are most likely to be those who didn't convert, staying with the faith of the Seven. Supporters of Stannis who stayed true to the Seven are known as King's Men. Now, from doing all the research we did for this episode, it seems like that very few of these Kingsmen came north with Stannis to the Wall. Though we did find some evidence that there were a few who came north with Stannis, the two prom most prominent examples being Davos Seaworth and House Valerian, whose banners are seen at the Battle of Castle Black. Uh, but almost all of the other Kingsmen, such as Roland Storm, actually, that's, that's my favorite bastard, the Bastard of Night Song. <laughs> that's a cool name, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the cooler names. And Sir Gilbert Faring stayed south to defend Dragonstone and Storm's End from the Lannisters and Tyrells. Now, meanwhile, those lords, knights, and soldiers who stayed with Stannis on their account of their devotion to the Lord of Light are known as Queen's Men. Uh, that queen not really being Selyse mm -hmm. so much uh, as this scandalously Melisandre would be who that really refers to. <laughs> so let's take a brief look, a brief look at the individual southern houses marching under Stannis' fiery banner. We have a uh, House Florent of the Reach. Uh, they're bound to Stannis through his marriage to Selyse Florent. They likely still comprise a majority of, Sa of Stannis' southern contingent. Um, another Reachman house, uh, I'm mean, sorry, Stormland's house uh, that we have is House Peasbury, uh, Newly turned to cannibalism. Yeah, that, that was those guys. <laughs> Cannibals. Uh, there should be, instead of peasbury, like meat berry. Meat berry? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> meat pie. Yeah. Meat pie. <laughs> yeah, they're not eating their peas. Uh, uh, anyways, their lord, Robin, uh, was marching under Stannis' banners at the end of A Dance of Dragons. Um, another house from the Stormlands, uh, House Fell. Uh, lord Fell was a queensman and a devotee to Rolor. However, he lived up to his name in the worst possible way. He fell into a frozen <laughs> pond and uh, froze to death. Uh, so, yeah. so much for him. We don't know who is the new head of House Fell now. Uh, Stannis also has a number of knights and lesser lordlings, some of whom will detail in their capacity as fighters and commanders in uh, later in the series, as we're not dealing with the battles per se just yet. No, mm -hmm. but no, fe never fear. We'll cover all the characters. <laughs> Few of them wield political power as well. That's part of why we're not uh, going into a lot of detail with them. Uh, and, of course, there are these, these guys are generally going to be really loyal to Stannis. If they've followed him this far, they've gone through the Battle of Blackwater, they followed him to the north, the wall, and all this, mm -hmm. they're not going to desert him, especially not for, like, Roose Bolt or anything no, like that. No, definitely so. not. Mm -hmm. they're, his, they're his loyal core. Yeah. Uh, the first support Stannis gains from the North itself, apart from at the Wall, is the Mountain Clans. John's advice, as it was earlier, was crucial. Men have lived up the high, ma high valleys and mountain meadows for thousands of years, ruled by their clan chiefs. Petty lords, you would call them, though they do not use such titles amongst themselves. Clan champions fight with huge two-handed great swords, while the common men sling stones and batter one another with staffs of mountain ash. A quarrelsome folk, it must be said. 
So, realizing that these clansmen are brave, strong fighters with awesome horses, begs the obvious question, why on earth didn't Rob take them south? Well, Rob did have clansmen with him, uh, just not nearly all of them. He didn't have time to get the rest, really. Uh, River Run was under siege. He had to, he had to get going. Yeah, Jon Snow kind of explains that it would have taken a lot of time for them to get to Rob Stark. Uh, you see, he tells Stannis, it's no good sending messages. Your, your grace will need to go to them yourself. Eat their bread and salt. Drink their ale. Listen to their pipers. Praise the beauty of their daughters and the courage of their sons, and you'll have their swords. The clans have not, been seen, have not seen a king since Torrin Stark bent his knee. Your coming does them great honor. Command them to fight for you, and they will look at one another and say, Who is this man? He is no king of mine. <laughs> now, there's a distinction to be made here. Pride versus duty. It is a recurring theme, and this is a place where it really comes into play. Stannis argues to John that these men have a duty to their true king, but John points out that their pride matters more to them than their sense of duty. So John's advice essentially boils down to this. If you address their sense of pride, they will embrace their sense of duty. Now, there is one final motivation that many of the Northerners have for joining Stannis, in particular the clansmen who live up where it's even colder, and this motivation is a dark one. Uh, winter is coming, and we're not referring to the others. Yeah, they're coming too, and they won't help, but in this case, <laughs> I, we're referring to just regular old winter, which in the North is death all by itself. Winter in the North means mostly living off of stored food and fighting men. And fighting men, often considered the most vital in other times, spring, summer, and fall, become a liability in winter. They eat the most, thus they are, signif they are a significant burden on the general population. Generations upon generations of men have relieved their family of this problem. John tells us how this happens in kind of a sad way. Hmm, yeah. When the snows fall and fruit and food grow scarce, their young must travel to the winter town or take service at one castle or the other. The old men gather up what strength remains in them and announce that they are going hunting. Some are found come spring. More are never seen again. Some are found in spring means that their bodies are eventually discovered after they had frozen to death in the winter. Uh, That's one way to relieve your family of the burden yeah, of feeding you. Yes, uh, but there is a better way to handle this. Better, yeah. <laughs> uh, the band with the silliest name has the most badass death for himself in mind. We present Big Bucket Wool. <laughs> winter is almost upon us, boy, and winter is death. I would sooner my men die fighting for Ned's little girl than alone and hungry in the snow weeping tears that freeze upon their cheeks. No one sings songs of men who die like that. As for me, I am old. This will be my last winter. Let me bathe in Bolton blood before I die. I want to feel it spatter across my face when my axe bites deep into a Bolton skull. I want, it to, lick, I want to lick it off my lips and die with the taste on my tongue. Now this speech fires up the clansmen, the other clansmen who are all also intent on winning or dying in the attempt of taking Winterfell and fighting Roos. Uh, most are so hardened to the idea that hey, winter will probably kill me anyway, so, you know, there's not much to be afraid of. You can't scare someone who's already facing starving to death and staring that in the face and, and isn't particularly uh, afraid of that. So these are people whose fathers and grandfathers have all, and their fathers and their grandfathers, have all faced the same situation over and over. Uh, so really, it's just kind of bred into them. They're, you're, you're not going to scare them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just too much. Too, they're just too tough for that. I shouted Morgan Little, blood and battle. Then all the hillmen were shouting, banging their cups and drinking horns on the table. That's one speech that I think anybody who reads the Song of Ice and Fire gets really fired up upon. I mean, <laughs> when I first read Dance with Dragons, and I was kind of struggling through some of the first parts of it, but my first read, that was the speech that just kind of, me, kind of got me started on really loving the series. Um, yeah. But, I mean, it's not just that these... Uh, Morgan Little or Big Bucket Wall are, are with Stannis. There's a number of other mountain clans as well with them. You have the Flints, the Walls, the Norris, the Burleys, the Harclays, the Littles, and the Knots. All these kind of made minor kind of clans that are uh, have kind of a less dis less uh, defined nobility and leadership structure than some of the more noble houses of Westeros. Yeah, they're like proto houses. Sort yeah, of. give another couple generations mm -hmm. and maybe they'll. Things will change, but yeah, they're kind of in between. They're 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 half clan, half wild clan. They're like halfway between wildling and you know Western right. noble house of the north. Yep. something like that. Anyway, mm -hmm. Stannis first deploys this enhanced army full of new, fired up, badass clansmen at Deepwood Mott, 
which is the stronghold of House Glover. The Glovers are a noble, uh, masterly, as opposed to lordly, house based out of the northwestern part of the north. Uh, the current master of Deepwood Mott and head of the household is Galbard Glover. If Galbard is unmarried, his heir is his brother, uh, Robert. Uh, you might pronounce that differently. We had a little Robert, debate over Robert, how to Robert, 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 Robert. 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 Yeah. <laughs> well, all sorts of different ways. Uh, so don't get mad at me if I'm not saying it your way. Uh, the Glovers have been, had been uh, staunch allies of the, of the Starks during the War of the Five Kings. Uh, they sent men south with the young wolf, uh, commanded by Galbard and Robert Robert. Robert, Robert. <laughs> uh, when in the, during the War of the Five Kings, Galbert seemed to have stayed close to Rob Stark and participated in Rob's Westerlands campaign and also the liberation of River Run as well from the Lannister siege. Uh, meanwhile, his brother Robert, Robert commanded Deepwood men and served <laughs> as the subordinate commander to Roose Bolton, notably taking part in cloak and dagger operations such as the taking of Harrenhal from the Lannisters. He's the one that praises Arya, Jaqen, Rorge, and Biter for throwing soup in the guards' faces. I never get praise for doing whenever I do that. <laughs> 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 While they were far in the south, Ironborn, led by Asha Greyjoy, took Deepwood Mott from the Glovers during the Greyjoy invasion in the north. So Asha took Sibel Glover, who was a lock by birth. We'll uh, return to that. All these all these entangling yeah. families married to each other, that's going to really come out here as well. <laughs> So she's taken prisoner when Asha takes the castle, and prior to the king's moot, Asha takes Sibel and her kids to Harlaw, the Ten Towers of Harlaw, where the, the Roderick the Reader is, and, you know, hangs out there for a bit. <laughs> but the thing is, when Asha failed to win at the king's moot, she left the two children of, um, the two Glover children at, um, ten, at the Ten Towers the, for House Harlaw, but she took Cybele, Robit's wife, with her as she returned to Deepwood. Um, the reason she did this is she's trying to flee Euron Greyjoy, and her, and also flee a marriage too, because Euron Greyjoy had forced her to marry an 80-year-old, too fat to stand husband. <laughs> so Asha's capture by Stannis might give the Glover children some security. It's possible that they'll be traded for each other at some point in the future. Uh, the Glover brothers uh, remained south of the neck for much of the time. Uh, we'll talk about them a bit later as well, but they're only brought up to speed on the events in the north at the end of the Clash of Kings. Um, after the Westerlands campaign, Galbart Glover is assigned by Rob Stark to carry fake letters in the event of capture and to link up with Howland Reed. However, Galbart hasn't been heard, of, ha hasn't been heard from since Storm of Swords, so where is he? You know, there's been a couple theories that have out there that have become popular, but I've always seeing Galbert Glover as Romania, as still being in Greywater Watch, working with Howland Reed. Yeah, I agree with you. Probably Greywater Watch. Maybe he's left already, though. Maybe people from Greywater Watch are on the move as we, you know, as we speak. I yeah. think you guys were both wrong. I think oh. he has clearly gone to Ashai to become a mask salesman. Oh, There's not, not lots gloves. Lots of money in mask salesmen now. Not gloves. Uh, not uh, Glover. Me. You'd think a Glover would sell gloves, but I thought it was the Tairashi, you know, with blue, blue beard <laughs> that worked with uh, Daenerys. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He's clearly Euron Greyjoy and Dario Naharis. Of course. And he's he's also Quentin's burned body. Yeah. Oh, okay. Albert, that makes sense. Albert is Quentin is is Euron is Dario. <laughs> yes. it, it, all, it, it all makes sense now. <laughs> yes. So uh, Robert Glover uh, remained with Roose Bolton at Harrenhal until he was ordered to attack Duskendale. In the ensuing battle, the northern force was badly defeated by Reach and Stormlander soldiers under under the command of Randall Tarley. Which is exactly what Roos wanted to happen. He got those men killed on purpose, basically. Robat and survivors flee from this battle, this trap, and fall into another trap, which is Gregor Cle Clegane and his men lying in ambush. So Robat is captured and subsequently exchanged for Martin Lannister. But that's not really the end of Robert's story. In A Dance with Dragons, we find Robert Glover at White Harbor, and we hear that he's been trying to raise men to continue fighting, but he hasn't had much success. Now, unbeknownst to everyone, or most everyone, Wyman and Robert are secretly working together, and they are planning on declaring for Stannis, assuming a few things happen. You know, Robert's actually one of the more intriguing characters from the North. He has, he's an experienced soldier. He's a broad-based range of experience militarily, and, you know, the way I would define him is that he has almost a special operations background. He does a lot of cloak and dagger missions and operations. Yeah, and it really it, it seems like he's good at that because a lot of people aren't aware of how badass he is. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's a cloak and dagger guy. He's done a good job of keeping himself uh, under wraps there. But we <laughs> feel like he's going to have a major role to play in the battle to come and perhaps beyond that. Uh, to, tease start, 
to, to tease part two a little, <laughs> uh, Robet's presence and the not-so-secret partnership with Wyman Manderley looks like it's going to have some major ramifications for the battle. The plural for mm. Winterfell. Uh, he could be very useful for Dennis, um, who, of course, he can thank for his restoration of his fam for his family's seat. Yeah, driving the Ironborn off uh, Glover lands was enough to bring a neighboring house to Stannis' side as well, House Mormont. The inclusion of House Mormont into Stannis' army was a bit of a surprise, I mean, given their initial reaction to the idea of supporting him. Because when Stannis sent ravens to the north demanding fealty, Lyanna Mormont, the ten-year-old daughter of Lady Mage Mormont, answered with pretty characteristic northern defiance. <laughs> Bear Island knows no king but the king in the north whose name is Stark. In all caps. <laughs> yeah, in right. all caps. Stark, yeah. <laughs> so a ten-year-old girl writing a withering response to Stannis Baratheon might seem odd, but what's odder and cooler still is that the Mormont clan is headed and subheaded by women. Well, how did this happen? The North isn't known for women being in charge, or mm -hmm. restaurants in general. Yeah. It? So let's, let's see how that happens. Uh, let's recap briefly. First of all, Jorah Mormont became spendthrift, putting it nicely, on uh, account of his <laughs> second wife, Lanasse Hightower. Uh, unfortunately, this match, along with his previous marriage to House Glover, by the way, which goes a bit to explaining their uh, connection to each other, as well as their being neighbors. Uh, so that didn't produce an heir, though. Jorah had no kids with his Glover wife. And he didn't have a child with Lanasse Hightower, either. So... With him off in Slaver's Bay, uh, not you know, pretty darn far from Bear Island. He's one of the most r far from Bear Island of any of the characters out there. Would you say that that Jorah wasn't a very good lover to his lover? <laughs> oh god! Oh, god. <laughs> I wouldn't two, say that. Two, no. two out of ten. Two out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the lordship of Bear Island passed to Mage Mormont, which is Jorah's father, Gior, the old bear himself. That's his sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, that's how House Mormont stood at the start of the War of the Five Kings. When Rob called his banners, the Mormonts answered in force. After Rob's Westerlands campaign, Mage Mormont, the head of House Mormont, was dispatched with false orders to Greywater Watch, along with Galbert Glover, and her intent is to link up with, get with Howland Reed, and um, I think part of the plan was to take uh, Moat Kalen from the north, or to use the Reeds to help to accomplish that. Yes. So, meanwhile, Daisy, one of Rob's personal guards, was uh, brutally murdered at the Twins by Sir Ryman Frey. Uh, pretty but, but Mage herself at least avoids the Red Wedding. Yeah. Now, we haven't seen her since Rob sent her off with false orders. So, where is she? Will she serve a different purpose in the story, or does she still have something to do? Uh, I probably she'll probably still have a purpose in the story, but I think it's more she'll be at Greywater Watch. She's with Galbert Glover at Greywater Watch. I know it's not very, very interesting prediction or analysis or something, <laughs> but... It is what it is. Yeah. But the thing is, prior to Stannis in launching his attack against Deepwood Mott, Alysanne, one of Mage's daughters, had positioned herself and her men in, at arms among fishing sloops off the coast of Deepwood. Mm -hmm. And when the Ironborn fled, Alysanne pounced and destroyed or seized all of the Ironborn ships, captains, and nobles. Uh, some she ransomed, the more wealthy ones, the nobility, and the rest she hanged. Yeah. <laughs> Typical. So, mm -hmm. Stannis won the Mormont's allegiance through victory over the Ironborn, a common enemy, and one the Mormont's take seriously. Asha smiled back. Mormont women are all fighters, too. The other woman's smile faded. What we are is what you made us. On Bear Island, every child learns to fear krakens rising from the sea. So, basically, this was the best thing Stannis could have done to win the Mormont's over, and obviously the Glovers. There's nothing better you can do than to, huh. you know liberate someone's castle for them. Uh, so this victory brought others to Stannis' side, men and soldiers who might seem insignificant at first glance, but seem destined to have a larger impact on the story, especially, you know, added together. Strength in numbers, that whole, that whole thing. <laughs> so in a letter to John, Stannis writes, Fisher folk, free riders, hillmen, crofters from the deep of the wolf's wood, and villagers who fled their homes along the stony shore to escape the Iron Men, survivors from the battle outside the gates of Winterfell, Men once swore into the Hornwoods, the Serwins, and the Tallhearts. So this inclusion of commoners into Stannis' army is a cool little detail, which we think shows that Stannis has appeal to the small folk. And, it, you know, it's hard not to respect a liberator. And right. <laughs> any inclusion of the small folk and commoners, uh, you know, having some agency and doing their own thing, it's always a nice detail. I think. Yeah, and we like to point that out, too. George puts, uh, likes to include the, the common man's perspective 
So so do we. We're especially going to have a, more of this in episode two when we deal with what the common soldier is feeling on the eve of battle, during battle, and perhaps in the aftermath as well. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. What's more significant in the meantime is that the survivors of Roderick Cassell's army joined with Stannis. And this has a major implication because of things that they may or may not know. So one of the interesting things about the survivors of Roger Cassell's army is that these men have the knowledge of the truth about the sack of Winterfell. Uh, we know that the Boltons have been spreading the lie that the Greyjoys, under Theon's command, sacked Winterfell. But the survivors from Roger Cassell's army would be able to tell the truth. It wasn't the Iron Men who burned the, who burned the uh, burned Winterfell, but rather it wasn't under Theon, but rather it was Ramsay Snow and the men from the Dread, Dreadfort who did the deed. So keep this in mind for future installments. It's gonna. It's it's very important to keep track of who knows what and how that affects their disposition and their attitudes, their loyalties, all that. But these men were probably only a small part of Stannis's army. Stannis's inclusion of these Northmen were welcome additions to his small army. But Stannis really needed more allies, ones who could provide food, shelter, and soldiers for his cause. Stannis needed the Manderleys. But the Manderleys fall into a category of Northmen who are somewhere in the middle. There are certain North houses whose loyalty is uncertain, maybe split down the middle, so to speak, or maybe they're waiting, like a lot of houses do, to see who gets the upper hand, and they'll join, you know, just, just to make sure they're on the winning side. Uh, but we'll see with houses like, say, the Karstarks and the Manderleys, uh, they may outwardly choose one house while secretly working for the other side, while secretly plotting betrayal, shall we say. Uh, so, in Stannis' case, his greatest ally is one that he not only doesn't know he has, but he thinks are against him. Mm -hmm. That is House Manderley. White Harbor, as one of the only five of the true cities in Westeros, is an extremely important ally. Uh, we see that for Davos, it's his prime mission to win their allegiance. House Manderley, uh, a little backstory on them. Uh, they're not a traditional northern house at all. They came from the Reach, uh, specifically the Mander River area, hence the name Mander Lee. They were apparently quite powerful. I mean, after all, the Mander is a significant river. It's the largest in the Reach and one of the largest in Westeros, period. So at some point, they overreached themselves somehow, perhaps, possibly, probably, <laughs> through rebellion against the Gardener Kings. They lost their power and status, after, as is often the case, after rebelling. <laughs> A thousand years before the conquest, a promise was made, and oaths were sworn in the wolf's den before the old gods and the new. When we were sore beset and friendless, hounded from our homes and in peril of our lives, the wolves took us in and nourished us and protected us against our enemies. The city is built upon the land they gave us. In return, we swore that we would always be their men, Stark men. And so it's kind of lucky for the North, for the Starks, and very satisfying for us readers after a bit of that, after a bit of a fake out, that Wyman <laughs> takes his oath to the Starks very seriously. Mm -hmm. And there's a little more to the oath, too. Um, the World of Ice and Fire uh, sample of the Stark family tree reveals that two Stark men took Manderly women to wife within the last five to six generations. So that's a while back, but likely still a point of pride, if not loyalty. Mm -hmm. So when Rob uh, calls his banners, Wyman Manderly dispatches both his sons and what ends up being about 10% of Rob's army. So 10% of Rob's initial army is basically all White Harbor. So that's that's a really significant amount of men. But that wasn't actually all that Wyman did for the Starks, for, for <laughs> Rob Stark. Um, when he comes, when Wyman Manerly comes to Winterfell in a clash of kings for the Harvest Feast, we have this. Lord Wyman also proposed to build Rob a war fleet. We have had no strength at sea for hundreds of years since Brandon the Builder put the torch to his father's ships. Grant me the gold, and I, within a year, I will float your sufficient galleys to take Dragonstone and King's Landing both. Now, Manderly may have worked with the Umbers on this. Uh, here's another quote. You have forests of tall pine and old orc. Old orc. Old oak. <laughs> <laughs> this is said to the Umbers, by the way. Lord Manderly has shipwrights and sailors in plenty. Together, you ought to be able to float enough longships to guard both your coasts. Now, the thing is about the Umbers is that they didn't really like the idea of working with Wyman Manderly but Sir Roger Cassell, Winterfell's Castellan, got them in line. And here's another quote from A Clash of Kings. And to Bran's astonishment, the truculent umbers agreed to do as he commanded, though not without some grumbling. So without this, uh, without that meeting, and without that uh, work by Sir Roderick, that these two houses may not have worked together on anything at all, uh, given the umbers' attitude. But since they worked together on the shipbuilding project, 
it may have also given the opportunity to the, for the Umbers and Mandalays to maybe share some secrets and to you know talk about what's happening with the Boltons and you know plot basically. Yeah, it's another thing to keep in mind for for later that Umber and Mandalay connection. It could have strategic strategic and political impact on the series. But one of the questions, outstanding questions of the series is, did those ships ever get built? Or rather, not to the series, but for, until A Dance with Dragons, was whether those ships ever got built. But in A Dance with Dragons, Lord Wyman Manerly tells Davis, I have been building warships for more than a year. Some you saw, but there are as many more hidden up the white knife. Even with the losses I have suffered, I still command more heavy horse than any other lord north of the net. My walls are strong, and my vaults are full of silver. Old Castle and Widow's Watch will take their lead from me. My bannermen include a dozen petty lords and a hundred landed knights. I can deliver King Stannis the allegiance of all the lands east of the White Knife, from Widow's Watch and Ramsgate to the Sheep's Head Hills and the headwaters of the Broken Branch. So basically, Wyman's rich and powerful with an army and a navy. No wonder everyone wants White, White Harbor as an ally. <laughs> so yes, there are a lot. There are ships, and he has a lot of soldiers left. And of course, Lord Wyman puts Rhaegar, Simon, and Jared Frey in pies and says, "What do you think?" So that's another important thing to have, uh, and it's something you want with in, in your allies: the ability to make pies and say funny things. <laughs> <laughs> but most importantly, Manderly is prepared to turn on the Lannisters and, by extension, the Boltons. He, he will, as he tells Davis, "I did not dare defy King's Landing so long as my last living son remained a captive." Lord Tywin Lannister wrote me himself to say that he had Willis. If I would have had, if I would have had him freed unharmed, he told me, I must repent my treason, yield my city, declare my loyalty to the boy king on the Iron Throne, and bend my knee to Roose Bolton, his warden of the North. Should I refuse, Willis would die a traitor's death. White Harbor would be stormed and sacked, and my people would suffer the same fates as the reigns of Castamere. But Willis Manderly is free now. No one can force White Harbor to do anything based on that hostage situation because it doesn't exist anymore. Well, and Tywin's dead. At least not really. Uh, they'd need to bring an army down on White, on White Harbor to make Manderly do anything. No one has that kind of leverage over him. So while he's seen as a great potential ally, he is not as feared as he might be despite his potential there. Manderly seems to have a reputation for cowardice. That's part of the problem. Uh, now consider what Lady Dustin says to Theon in regards to that. The fat man would like to kill us all, I do not doubt, but he does not have the belly for it, for all his girth. Under that sweaty flesh beats a heart as craven and cringing as, well, yours. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, we just heard about how he stalemated the demands of Tywin himself with his only son's life in the balance. Now he's ridden to Winterfell with a relatively small force, and he certainly showed no fear when totting Sir Hostine Frey. It seems his extreme weight has given others the wrong idea, and he is hamming it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. If they think he's craven, he'll let them, and thus un underestimate him. For now, he pretends to be an obedient to the crown, accepting Lord Bolton as Warden of the North and a fray husband for his son's eldest daughter. But he remembers, and he wants revenge beyond the pies. <laughs> Lord Wyman has obvious reasons to hate Lord Bolton, as he knows who's truly responsible for the death of his younger son, but this animosity goes back a bit farther than the Red Wedding. First off, uh, White Harbor and the Dread Four, they're sort of neighbors. They're not directly next to each other, but they have a lot of common areas of dispute, such as the Hornwood lands, which border both of their lands, uh, Manderley and Bolton. So one early flashpoint in the series was the widow of Lord Halley's Hornwood, Danella. When Rob called his banners in Game of Thrones, uh, Hallis Hornwood went south with Rob and died, uh, and maybe was deliberately sent to die by Bolton, because uh, he was under Bolton's command, at the Battle of the Green Fork. And this made Danella the most eligible bachelorette north of the neck. When Wyman Manderly visited Winterfell for the Harvest Feast in A Clash of Kings, he proposed marriage between himself or his son Wendell. Lady Danella is their cousin, and she herself was born Danella Manderly. Makes but, sense. Uh, but... But Ramsay Snow seized Lady Danella while she was on her way back from the Harvest Feast and forcibly married her. This put the Manderleys and Boltons on a war footing. And Wyman Manderley seized the Hornwood Castle in response to this to prevent the bastard of Bolton from expanding Bolton holdings into Hornwood lands. And it was said that Danella ate her own fingers and starved to death after Ramsay locked her in a tower and left her. Several people, including Theon, believe this, so it's, it's probably true. Now, it's mentioned that there was blood found around her mouth, and that's a curious uh, point of comparison. 
I think the truth about what happened to Lady Danella Hornwood slash Manderley is actually a bit darker. Uh, check this quote out. There's blood on your mouth, Ramsey observed. Have you been chewing on your fingers again, Reek? No, 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 my lord, I swear. Reek had tried to bite his own ring finger off once to stop it hurting after they had stripped the skin from it. So I think what actually happened was he probably did leave her to starve, but he also flayed some of her fingers, and she was biting them off to cut the pain, not to eat them, although she may have needed to do both. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's we don't need to go into too much detail with that. That's really disturbing. Uh, <laughs> so the Ironborn have their game, the finger dance, but Ramsey plays his own sort of finger dance. <laughs> In any, I mean, in any case, though, Lord Wyman had to abandon his claim to the Hornwood lands as part of his acceptance of Roos as his new overlord. Ramsay has been calling himself Lord of, Lord of Hornwood and signing his name that way. But we know how the mind of a typical Westerosi works when it comes to injury done to family. What Ramsay did to Wyman's cousin is as unlike to be forgotten as the Manderley Oath is to the Starks. So for now, he's pretending to be a good little vassal, minus the little, <laughs> though he and the phrase are openly hostile to one another. But, I mean, Lord Wyman didn't bring anyone of note to Winterfell that Roos could use as a, as a potential hostage because he doesn't want to give Bolton any more leverage over him than he already has. He brought only 300 men, which by itself is quite telling. Earlier we showed him talking about how he had a significant army still. Now, it's possible he's deployed his some or all of his main strength up the white knife, lying in wait or some sort of reserve strength, some sort of surprise. But hidden or not, the wound he took near the end of A Dance of Dragons and his size means that, most, that he's most certainly not with the troops. He, mm -hmm. may not, he may not be banking heavily on surviving the upcoming series of engagements, but if he does, he'll be likely allied with Stannis. And if that happens, or when that happens... Stannis will learn that Davos is alive, he thinks he's dead, and he will learn that Rickon is alive, and that, and he may gain possession of Rickon, which is a huge coup for Stannis, potentially. Yeah, Rickon can bring the entire north to Stannis, and ap apart from the staunch Boltons. Right. But Stannis is trapped in the snow. How exactly is he supposed to learn Manderly is going to switch to his set? How will news of Rickon get to Lord Manderly? Communication issues could really throw things off here. As of the Theon spoiler chapter, Stannis still believes the lies. And he says, Lord, too fat to sit a horse, too fat to come to me, yet he comes to Winterfell, too fat to bend the knee and swear me his sword, yet now he wields that sword for both. I sent my onion lord to treat with him, and Lord, too fat, butchered him and mounted his head on the hand and hands on the walls of White Harbor for the fray to gloat over. And the phrase, has the Red Wedding been forgotten? Man, Stannis really is the funniest. Yeah, he really is. That's a great, <laughs> too fat to come to me. Uh, a betrayal is coming to you. It's coming to help you, though, Stannis. Don't worry. <laughs> Davos is alive, and Lord Wyman seems to have considered all of this from many angles. But when we're pondering betrayals, we must realize that Roos is not simply humming merrily along, flaying with, away without a care in the world. Roos knows about potential betrayals, and Lady Dustin knows that he knows, as she tells Theon. You think Roos does not know? Silly boy, watch him. Watch how he watches Manderley. No dish so much as touches Roos's lips until he sees Lord Wyman eat of it first. No cup of wine is sipped until he sees Manderley drink of the same cask. I think he would be pleased if the fat man attempted some betrayal. It would amuse him. Roos himself seems to know as well. My fat friend Lord Wyman plots betrayal. <laughs> Lady Dustin might be exaggerating or overconfident. When the Manderleys and Freys come to blows at Winterfell, Theon takes note. Bruce Bolton said nothing at all, but Theon Greyjoy saw a look in his pale eyes that he had never seen before, an uneasiness, even a hint of fear. So whatever the truth, Roos is unlikely to be caught off guard, at least not entirely. Uh, so uh, we pointed out that, the, that Manderley had named several houses that he could bring with him in joining Stannis. Several of these are in a position to betray Roos as well. The first of these is House Locke. They're a northern house ostensibly sworn to Roos Bolton. Yeah, but at the same time, even though they're sworn to Roos Bolton, in White Harbor, a Locke man describes Ramsay as a mad, cruel monster. Oh. And if you recall from earlier, White Man Wyman Manderley says he can bring over the lands east of the White Knife, including Old Castle, the ancestral home of the Locks. Yeah, we should probably believe Lord Wyman. Sir Donald Locke was slain at the Red Wedding even. And it is Lord Andrew Locke, the old man, who calls for a maester when Lord Wyman is wounded. So he's displaying his loyalty yeah. openly. Lord Andrew doesn't seem too pleased to be a Winterfell either. When the <laughs> blizzard kicks off, he says... The gods have turned against us, old Locke was heard to say in the Great Hall. 
This is their wrath, a wind as cold as hell itself, and snows that, ever, that never end. We are cursed. <laughs> and as we mentioned before, Isabel Glover is a lock by birth, and Stannis freed her from captivity. So surely this is on Locke's mind as a point of loyalty. He would rather, you'd think he would rather fight for the guy that freed his, well, we don't know if Locke is as Sybil as his daughter or what, but still, they're kin. So finally, though, Arya Stark herself, the real Arya, not Jane Poole, again, <laughs> right. has Locke blood through her great-grandmother. So Manerly's 300 men aren't exactly friendless, though the Locks and others did march, although... Did the Walks or others march with the White Harbor men to the Battle of Ice? Hmm. This is a point we're not exactly clear on. It doesn't seem like they did, but it's an open, outstanding question. But after House Lock, we have a few other houses, and there's some other minor houses in the north sworn to House Bolton. Like others, their loyalty doesn't seem as strong to us as, their, as it's outwardly seems in the, in the story. Yeah. It's more of the force variety. Here's another quote. Flints, Serwins, Tallhearts, Slates, they all had men with Young Wolf. Robin Flint was killed at the Red Wedding, for example. Now, um, according to the semi-canon A Song of Ice and Fire campaign guide, which was published in 2012, Robin was the lord of Flint's finger. Whether that is accurate, and it, it probably is, as it's so recent, um, but the world of Ice and Fire might clear it up. Uh, Robin was, according to canon, a, a son of a branch, uh, he was a son branch of uh, <laughs> Lyessa of House Flint. Another House Flint. This one of Widow's Watch. Uh, again, there are three branches of House Flint. Widow's <laughs> Watch, the, that long point sticking off the east coast, the part of the area that Wyman Manderley uh, claims will follow him. Mm -hmm. Flint's Finger, the jut on the west coast above the Iron Islands somewhat near Barrowton, and the originals, the Mountain Clan Flints. The OG Flints. <laughs> OG Flints. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, Widow's Watch has a reason to hate Bolton and the phrase, and they supposedly will follow Manderley's lead. Two things pointing to unreliable at best for, for Roos. Like the locks, it's possible that they marched with White Harbor. So the Mountain Clan Flints are direct supporters of Stannis and the biggest proponents of risking Arya, because like the House Lock situation, she is kin. Fake Arya has all these expectations, and she can't live up to them because she's <laughs> not Arya. The real Arya's other great-grandmother was a Flint of the Mountain, so Locke and Flint are her great-grandmothers there. Yeah, but the, the flints of Flint's fingers, on the other hand, seem to be more for Bolton through House Dustin. We've heard very little about this branch of House Flint. A Flint crossbowman was found dead in the stables, one of the many murder victims during the wait for Stannis at Winterfell. So, uh, perhaps the campaign guide had, correct, had incorrect information about Robin Flint, or perhaps the Flint profited from Robin Flint's death and thus has no grudge. Yeah, so it's uh, a little confusing, uh, that situation. And given how a lot of houses are just pretending to go along with things, it's really hard to, to peg these guys. So, like uh, so many other houses, they might just be going along with the Boltons because they have a lack of options or they're just afraid. Yeah, and so... They could be afraid, but moving on, as with the Manderleys and basically all the others, Roos is aware he cannot trust some of, the, some of his men too far. He says, The Serwins and the Tallhearts are not to be relied upon. But he also knows they're weak and not in great shape after both the Red Wedding and the campaigns in the War of the Five Kings. So yeah, some of these houses are particularly beat up, in particular uh, House Tallhart, for example. Uh, there's men of theirs at Hat Winterfell right now supporting Roos, uh, but they got they got really kicked around badly throughout the books, P possibly one of the worst. <laughs> Their castle, Torrin Square, was taken by Dagmar Cleftra, as we mentioned earlier, uh, lost by him thanks to Sir Roderick Castell, and then retaken by him when Sir Roderick had to turn his attention back to Winterfell and Theon. Dagmar now has a lady of Torrin Square, her cousin and heir, as his sister, and has his own captives as well. So that's a big, uh, big batch of... Uh, Tallhearts he's got. <laughs> now, master of the castle himself, Sir Helman Tallhart, died at Duskendale in that same trap that got Robert Glover captured. Uh, his son, Benfred, was captured by Theon and ritually drowned on the stony shore. That was the same scene where Theon killed one of his own men for fighting over loot. And his brother, Leobald, was with Sir Roderick outside Winterfell and was killed by Ramsay's army alongside Clay, heir to House Serwin, our next house. Uh, they're overall in similar shape to House Tallhart. They've lost all of their military leaders, and they took major losses at Ramsay's hands while they were part of Sir Roderick's army, as well as in the south with Rob. 
Yes, Lord Mager Sirwin himself was injured at the Battle of the Green Fork under Roose Bolton's command. In addition, Lord Mager's right-hand man, Sir Kyle Condon, was left behind on Roose's orders in the south prior to the wet Red Wedding. His fate is unknown at this point, from what we can tell, but it seems that Roos got him out of the way. Yeah, uh, Lord Sirwin dies of his wounds uh, while at Harrenhal in Tywin Lannister's captivity. Uh, and Arya sees the Silent Sisters preparing his body for the journey north, for you know his bones and burial. Here's hoping that his bones actually make it north, as opposed to Eddard Stark. Yeah, <laughs> Ned's bones certainly did not. We know that Lady Dustin's waiting for them. Yeah, so that would uh, be an interesting point of comparison, whether or not uh, yeah. Sirwin bones ever made it home. The Sirwins uh, may not have taken losses at the Red Wedding in actuality, but their lands are a half day's ride from Winterfell, and at least one Sirwin has married into House Stark in recent generations, so they have a lot of reasons for loyalty. You know, it just occurred to me that this is a different spelling of Sirwin than Sirwin of the Mirror Shield. Oh, you know, There's right. that character, Sir, yeah, Sir, that's that true. Sirwin is with an S, and this is with a C. Interesting. But uh, no relation whatsoever to those. <laughs> Just jumped out at me. So, anyway, but these House Sirwin, with their proximity, uh, and there is a marriage in the past, at least one marriage in the past with the Sirwins to the Starks, so you would think they would jump at a chance to help restore the Starks, but that, as with all these things, it depends on their leader. Who's the head of the household of the Sirwins right now? The current head of House Sirwin is Lord Medgar's daughter, Lady Janelle. Given that half-day's ride proximity, and the knowledge that Lord Medgar once thought to marry Janelle to none other than Rob Stark, uh, <laughs> what are the odds that Lady Sirwin knows that Arya is a fake? Strong. But like others, knowing is only half the battle. What is she going to do about, about it? What is she going to do with that knowledge? I guess we'll have to wait and see, or she's going to wait and see, I suppose. It's not the only thing she's keeping her mouth shut about, apparently. Yeah, as with so many others, Roos has perhaps taken steps to keep her close. He's taken her maester and has been using him at Winterfell. This maester named Rodri is probably aware of the truth about Winterfell that Ramsay did it. Since the army Sir Roderick raised to reclaim the castle from Theon had a large servant component, surely some of the survivors made it back to the castle. And in that case, surely Maester Rodri knows. This might be why Roos keeps him so close at Winterfell in A Dance with Dragons. He seems to have been given charge of the Winterfell Ravens. We last see him standing beside Roos with a raven on his arm, as Lord Bolton informs the assembled lords that he's had word from his double agents in Stannis' camp, and that it's time to attack. Now, the same is true for the mayor of House Hornwood, uh, Medric, who is also kept close by Roos. Roos has three maesters with him at Winterfell, and none of them are the Dreadfort maesters. This is a, a kind of a sneaky subplot that's happening that we, that we spent a bit of time investigating for this episode. So he's currently at Winterfell, too. Yeah, I always thought it was a little weird that he had those maesters, and that he uh, feels like, honestly, the correct thing would just be to kill them. I mean, <laughs> they, they have the ravens. Like, you can't just, like, check them. Like, they can yeah. just betray you so easily. It just feels weird to trust maesters that you shouldn't trust. Anyways, yeah, uh, it's this maester, it's this maester, uh, maester Medric, uh, who comes to Lord Wyman's aid when Hostine Frey slices his neck. He may be the one who sent the letter to Winterfell back in A Clash of Kings, um, informing Lewin and Sir Roderick and Bran about Ramsay's crimes. You know, the aforementioned uh, forced marriage, starving finger playing of Lady Hornwood. <laughs> so like many, the Hornwood lands are ostensibly sworn to House Bolton. They bring, when, they bring men to, the, to Winterfell for the wedding and for the wedding for Stannis. However, despite the Boltons claiming their lands, and despite Ramsay declaring himself Lord of the Hornwood, they can't be considered that strong of an ally given what happened. Yeah, as, as they say, and do you imagine the Hornwood men have forgotten the bastard's last marriage and how his lady wife was left to starve chewing on her own fingers? That was Lady Dustin saying that. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. She's our uh, source for so much things, so many things in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they are in shambles, however. Like houses, Sirwin and Tallheart, they're leaderless. Lord Hornwood is killed in battle, and Roos may have helped that along by giving him a dangerous assignment. And Lord Hornwood's son and heir, Darren, was killed alongside Lord Rickard Karstark's sons, defending Rob against Jamie Lannister at the Whispering Wood. So all that remains is Lord Hornwood's bastard son, who is but 12 years old and is recognized by no one as the rightful lord. He was actually at Deepwood Mott uh, when Asha took it. Uh, presumably, he was set free when the castle was restored, but he could be a captive at Ten Towers. But we don't we don't hear that mentioned. We hear her, we hear Asha say specifically Lady Glover's children. So uh, believe this this whole uh, this this Lonnie Snow is his name, I believe. I believe mm -hmm. he's still on the loose, but. It doesn't seem he doesn't seem to be important at this point, so we'll we'll move on. Um, 
Anyway, the Hornwood men don't have a leader like the Sirwin men and the Talhart men. They're just following Roos kind of, they're kind of headless. Uh, so the one problem with them turning on Roos, while we think that's a possibility, who's going to organize them to do that? You know, these, these, these are men who are used to following orders as much as they may harbor these doubts and, and resentments. They well, need someone to lead them. It's kind of interesting, though, too, that, um, you know, when Stannis picks up those Hornwood men from Lord Sir Roger Cassell's army, that could be a very big um, influence on uh, whether those men will turn if they see their brothers in arms marching under Stannis' banners that have been missing for at least a year and a half or so since the sack of, of Winterfell. That's a good point. Very good point, yeah. But while Wyman Manorly and his houses are sworn to him, though, there are others that are secretly working against the Boltons. Uh, Roos has or um, has had some northern men secretly working against Stannis. Now, this would be the double mo uh, double, mo double agents that we mentioned <laughs> a little while ago. It was a double moment. <laughs> a double moment, yeah, I agree. So, it, specifically, this is House Karstark. Uh, in a lot of ways, House Karstark is the most screwed house in the North. <laughs> uh, something... Yeah, <laughs> something that John. This is something that John Snow thinks. He thinks that exactly. Yeah, he thinks, boy, those car sharks are screwed. <laughs> uh, so when he hears that the car sharks have sworn for Stannis, that's basically what he thinks. But Arnulf Karstark has this convoluted plan to unscrew another technical term, unscrew <laughs> House Karstark. So the complex motivations of Arnulf Car of Arnulf. Karstark. Arnulf say, Karstark is name. not easy to say. Yeah. Arnulf <laughs> was uncle to Rickard Karstark, Lord of Carhold, and is currently Castellan there, not heir to the castle, but as we'll see, he has ambitions. Now, he starts by swearing allegiance to Stannis, which makes sense because they've earned the hostility of House Lannister, thanks to Rickard murdering those young squire prisoners who were both Lannisters. Of course, they also hate the Starks, given Rob executing Lord Karstark for that exact crime. But Arnolf Karstark has a bit of a plan going on here. He's hoping to get Harry and Karstark, Lord Rickard's eldest son and lawful heir to Carhold, killed. Harry and Karstark is held captive by the Lannisters at Maidenpool. He was part of the same trap that killed Helmut Tallhart and got Robert Glover captured. Arnolf hopes that, Lann that the Lannisters will execute Harry in response to his declaration for Stannis. With Harry and dead, he can wed his son, Cragen, to the heir of Carhold, Alice Karstark, thus securing his Karstark branch as heirs to Carhold. This is basically the same thing the Boltons are doing with fake Arya, and the same thing Tywin wanted to do with Tyrion and Sansa. This could be yeah, a car so Karstarks? <laughs> <laughs> car Karstark, yeah, it just keeps you keep adding car to the beginning. Eventually you'll have car, 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 Karstarks. <laughs> uh, the, the catch here is that Arnolf is secretly on Bolton's side. His declaration for Stannis was just a, a plot and part of his you know, thinking to get Harry executed. So his idea is he's going to join Stannis and then give him bad advice, uh, which will in turn win him a new place in, uh, or a high place rather, in the new Roos Bolton regime in the north. And of course, Roos would confirm Arnolf's uh, situation in Car at Carhold with the new marriage and all that, given that, you know, Arnold, you scratch your back and I'll scratch yours, that whole situation. So. So that's, that's Arnold's plan, but no, none of this works. <laughs> Not, none, none of, of it works. <laughs> Alice moves away, Cregan chases her and is taken captive by Jon Snow, Harrion is not executed, and the plan to betray Stannis backfires horribly. Arnold fails to convince Stannis to attack the Dreadfort, which was a bolt and trap. Uh, but he and his men stay with Stannis on campaign, waiting for a different opportunity to betray him. But, as luck would have it, Stannis got a hold of Theon, and Theon knew of Arnolf's betrayal because Roos and Ramsay spoke of it in his presence. So Stannis brings in Arnolf and all his sons and grandsons and informs them. You are dead men. Understand that, the king <laughs> went on. Only the manner of your dying remains to be determined. You would be well advised not to waste my time with denials. Confess and you shall have the same swift end that the young wolf gave Lord Rickard. Lie, and you will burn. Choose. So, that's it for them. The Karstark, <laughs> <laughs> the Karstark soldiers will probably fight for Stannis, though, despite this uh, situation with their leaders, because that's who they were told to fight for. That They didn't know the, the betrayal plot. They were told they were going to fight for Stannis, and mm -hmm. that's, that's what they're still going to believe. As he says, uh, Karstark could never have hoped to keep his treachery a secret if he shared his plans with every base-born man-jack in his service. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> Shut up, you guys. Base born sure. man, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Anyways, I was trying so hard to keep a straight face, and you guys both. <laughs> I even read that beforehand and prepared. Some... <laughs> I'm not going to laugh when I read Baseball and Jack. Nope, sorry. <laughs> Some drunken spearman would have let it slip one nice while slaying with a whore. They did not need to know. So, so far we have double crossers and fervent allies. So why not, having, why not have a house playing both sides? Uh, we do have that. House Umber. House Umber is split in half in loyalty between two brothers who are not actually hostile towards each other. There's a very interesting reason why they're playing both sides. Uh, Hother, Horsebane Umber, supports Roos likely on account of the phrase holding Great John Umber at the Twins. Hother, for his part, doesn't actually seem all that loyal to Roos. He's just there to preserve the life of his nephew. Roos Bolton even says, The Umbers may seem simple, but they are not without a certain low cunning. Ramsey should fear them all, as I do. And then also uh, Lady Dustin, our source for pretty much everything, says, <laughs> Do you imagine... Horace Bane loves you any better? If you did not hold the great, the great John, he would pull out your entrails and make you eat them, as Lady Hornwood ate her fingers. Now, Hawthor has mostly graybeards with him inside Winterfell, as most of House Umber's strength was lost in the war or at the Red Wedding. On the other side, we have one-eyed Moore's crow food, Umber. <laughs> sorry, I, I, all of a sudden I started thinking of crow doof. <laughs> <I'm so laughs> In our sorry. document, I wrote crow doof instead of crow food. <laughs> you got so me in the that's giggles. funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's funny. <laughs> yes, uh, so Moore's uh, supports Stannis Baratheon because Stannis brings him the burnt skull of Mance Raider. Uh, he'd Mance be, Raider. Yeah, Mance Raider. <laughs> he'd be disgusted if he knew it was really Rattleshirt Skull. Yeah, I wouldn't so, want to drink out of that. Maybe happy he was dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Moore swears allegiance to Stannis on the condition he doesn't, that he doesn't have to fight his brother Hother. So far, that doesn't look like it'll be a problem because Moore's doesn't really have a whole lot of soldiers. Yeah, tell me, Theon, how many men did Moore's Umber have with him at Winterfell? None. No men. He grinned at his own wit. He had boys. I saw them. Twenty green boys with spades. Yeah, these boys used the cover of that ridiculous snowstorm outside of Winterfell to dig pits outside of Winterfell's front gates. This pays off majorly as Aenys Frey, the commander of the Frey army, falls in one of these pits and breaks his neck. Morris is basically the unofficial arm of the Umbers, uh, working against the Bolton cause in secret. In addition to the pits, he's the one making all that noise at night, keeping the soldiers in Winterfell sleeping poorly and with plenty of, in of anxiety. He's the one who finds Theon outside Winterfell with fake Arya shortly after they jump and sends them along to Stannis. So Stannis is getting some support, but there's no way the uh, Umbers can openly defy Bolton unless they suddenly out of nowhere, just decide that they want the Great John to be dead, which that's not going to happen, I don't think. Yeah, no, I think it's very unlikely that they would want that. Um, but if Bolton power is broken completely and Roos is slain, Lord Walter would have no need of his hostage and would likely instead ransom the Great John back to the Umbers. But Bolton slain? That's almost hard to imagine at this point. Let's, let's talk about how well Roos is prepared, despite the fact that so many people aren't really loyal to him and are maybe looking for a chance to stab him in the back. So let's get into Roos Bolton himself. You had only to look at Bolton to know that he had more cruelty in his pinky toe than all the phrase combined. Now for a more thorough treatment of Roos and Ramsey, check out our episode on House Bolton. We don't want to rehash too much old ground that we've already covered, but we will recap what's relevant to the uh, upcoming battles and the campaign in general, and we'll add some detail to places we haven't explored as deeply before. In a Game of Thrones, after Robb Stark calls his banners, Lord Roos is given charge of the greater part of the northern armies, particularly the foot and infantry. And he uses this authority to systemically decimate certain houses in the north. At first he does this with, with future gain in mind, but without actually sabotaging the, nor the northern war effort. Anytime there's fighting to be done, he makes sure the dangerous jobs go to very specific lords and their men. At the Battle of the Green Fort, for instance, Lord Hornwood, who we talked about a little bit earlier, is killed. We can guess that Roos likely had to likely put him and his men in the vanguard. Likewise, in the same battle, Lord Serwin is injured and captured and later dies of his wounds. The Hornwood lands happen to be right next to the Bolton lands we talked about before. And yeah. soon enough, Ramsay comes to forcibly marry the Hornwood widow and calls himself the Lord of Hornwood. Meanwhile, House Serwin happens to be the closest castle distance-wise to House to Winterfell being a half day's ride from it. 
Very <laughs> tricky, Roos. <laughs> so, after Rob screws the political situa situation up, frankly, with his marriage and by failing to bring the veil into the war, Roos pretends to maintain loyalty while getting many northern soldiers killed. In other words, he actually begins to sabotage the northern war effort instead of playing both sides. He does this with all the precision of a flaying knife, uh, to use a little bit of a metaphor. <laughs> Carefully he reduces the strength, yeah, a little one. He reduces the strength of the northern lords, and in addition to the Hornwoods, who are the prime target, he allows Tallheart and Glover men to be trapped and slaughtered by Sir Gregor and Lord Tarley. He allows White Harbor, Locke, Nori, and Burley men to be trapped on the wrong side of the river crossing and slaughtered by the omni omnipresent Sir Gregor as they were going up to the twins for uh, Edmure Tully's wedding. Then he leaves behind Serwin, Manderley, and Stoutman to keep Gregor from crossing after them. These men were either caught from behind and killed later, or made or made it to the Red Wedding and died there. And that's just what we hear about. Surely Roos made a few other plays to weaken his current and future enemies. So the pattern is straightforward and clear once it's revealed. He endangers his neighbors and the houses traditionally and recently strong in their devotion to House Stark, all while protecting his own men and those of his allies such as the Dustin and Riswells. And it may sound strange but, and a bit striking, but Roos took around 4,000 men south of him amongst the roughly 20,000 that went south total. Most of those 20K were slain, but he lost almost none. So that's, that's really masterful if you think about it. <laughs> In a very brutal sense of the word. Yeah, uh, ruthless, really ruthless. Yeah, really ruthless, masterful and ruthless. But not only are several northern houses reduced in manpower, but many are essentially leaderless via their deaths and hostages. Um, we talked about the gutting of houses Tallheart, Serwin, and Hornwood, but he manipulated other houses as well. Now, Roos, as we said before, Roos set up Willis Manderley to be killed or captured, and the latter did happen. Lord Wyman was thus kept in check by Sir Willis's captivity for a long time. Uh, we must recall, as we have, that Lord, given that Lord Manderley and Lord Bolton were fighting over those Hornwood lands throughout a lot of this, uh, and that, of course, Lord Horn, rather Lady Hornwood is kin to, Lo to Lord Wyman. So Roos knew that it w getting the White Harbor as an ally was kind of out of the question, given all that bad blood. So the next best thing was to kind of neutralize them to get them out of the picture so that they couldn't get in his way. And so it becomes clear that Roos started making moves for his takeover of the North before the end of A Clash of Kings, that this was his backup plan for Rob losing the war all along. Yeah, he's either got to be working at a key cog on the winning side and a major power in a new northern kingdom, or the prime beneficiary of a Lannister victory in charge of the north through them. Basically, he played the Game of Thrones in such a way as to maximize his ability to take advantage of the chaos and shifting power that inevitably comes with war. All around him, the realm got weaker and he kept getting stronger. This is perhaps not far from Littlefinger with an army and the ability to lead it. And Lady Dustin gives a little more insight as to what Lord Bolton's ultimate ambitions are. Lord Bolton aspires to more than mere kingship. Why not Lord of the North? Tywin Lannister is you dead. Said, inverted. What did I say? You said, aspires to more than mere kingship. Why not Lord of the <laughs> North? Oh, why not? <laughs> why not? Aspires to more than mere lordship. Why not King in the North? Okay, whoops. Tywin Lannister is dead. The Kingslayer is maimed. The Imp is fled. The Lannisters are a spent force, and you were kind enough to rid him of the Starks. Old Walder Frey will not object to his fat little Walda becoming a queen. So, by the time we meet up again with Roose Bolton in A Dance with Dragons, he's easily the most powerful northern political and military figure, having spared most of his Dreadfort men from becoming casualties and having Frey levies bolstering the sides of his hosts. Roos has also cleverly shifted blame away from himself. The evils in the south are blamed on the Freys, and the evils in the north are blamed on Ramsay. He tends to disavow Ramsay's actions while distinctly profiting from them. This is the man Stannis is up against. I personally think Roos is easily as formidable as Tywin, except that you know Tywin had more going for him in terms of resources. Uh, so Bolton can't remotely approach the wealth and power of Castle Rock, but in terms of doing the best you can with what you got, well... Roos gained the north. He lost almost no men in the process while doing severe damage to his enemies and the people who could get in his way. And he even got a fat pile of silver from uh, Lord Walder by marrying, you know, fat That Walder. said, if he doesn't take firm control over the north, a stark return could end all chance of such. And I think it will. Yeah. <laughs> Once he has everything well in hand, Rickon's return will mean less. He could also be thinking that he'll be able to devote more time and energy to finding that threat and cutting it off before it develops. 
Roos may believe that Rickon's youth gives him some measure of extra time. But he also faces other issues. Of course, there's the impending Manderly betrayal and the failure of his double agent Crosstark allies, but there is also resentment from and amongst his closer allies. Several of them hate him and or each other. The clearest example is that pretty much everyone hates the phrase. <laughs> uh, one of the best examples, what Lord Manderly says to <laughs> Sir Hostine Frey, and it's surely one of the most snappy insults of the entire series. This is af right after Little Wilder is found dead. So young, said Wyman Manderly. Though mayhaps this was a blessing. Had he lived, he would have grown up to be a Frey. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Dustin points out the obvious reason for Manderly's contempt. And Lord Wyman is not the only man who lost kin at your red wedding, Frey. House Riswell, too, said Roger Riz Riswell. Even Dustin's out of Barrowton. Lady Dustin parted her lips in a thin, feral smile. The North remembers, Frey. This is said, and Roos is present, and Roos knows that Lady Dustin and these others are not fools. They know he was directly responsible for the deaths of at least some of their fighting men. They can't say this to his face, but they can not say it to Amy Frey's face, or they can say something similarly challenging, because they're Roos's most important allies. Specifically, to start, House Dustin. House Dustin's lands encompass the Barrow lands, which are in the southwest area of the north, uh, directly above Flint's Finger. Uh, Lady Barbary Dustin, nay Riswell, she is a Riswell by birth, that's important, she is highly motivated, highly motivated by her hatred of the Starks. Yeah, Roos kind of reminds us about this when, uh, when he says, Barrowton is staunch for Bolton, largely because she holds Ned Stark to blame for her husband's death. He says largely because, so there's more to it, isn't there? Yeah, Brandon Stark himself, Ned's older brother, was her lover, and he was fostered at Barrowton, but marriage between the two never occurred, as Brandon wound up betrothed to Catelyn Tully. Barbary was instead betrothed to William Dustin. When Ned called the banners for Robert's rebellion, rebellion Willem rode off to war against his wife, Barbary's wishes. Willem Dustin fi died fighting against the King's Guard at the Tower of Joy. So Barbary holds a bit of a grudge against the Starks for spurning the marriage and for not returning Willem's bones. Her bitterness runs really, really deep. She was married for less than six months before her husband rode off to die. In other words, she got half a year of marriage, followed by 17 years of widowhood. Never remarried, never had any kids. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't sound like a happy person. Just no. <laughs> Interestingly, she claims to be keeping an eye out for Ned's bones, which left River Run long ago. But even if Barbary has a hatred of the Stark, this doesn't mean that she's especially loyal to the Boltons. After all, the dust is lost men at the Red Wedding, like most northern houses. Lady Barbary also has a hatred for the Freys, telling Hostine. The North remembers Frey, as mentioned. As with all his allies, Roos doesn't trust with his most certain allies. He says, even here in Barrowton, the crows are circling, waiting to feast upon our flesh. But Lady, Dust but Lady Dustin, conversely, is confident in Roos. White Harbor might prove troublesome should Lord Wyman survive this coming battle. But I am quite sure that he will not. No more than Stannis. Bruce will remove both of them as he removed the young wolf. Who else is there? You, said Theon. There is you, the Lady of Barrowton, a Dustin by marriage, a Riswell by birth. That pleased her. She took a sip of wine, her dark eyes sparkling, and said, The widow of Barrowton. And yes, if I so choose, I could be an inconvenience. Of course, Bruce sees that too, so he takes care to keep me sweet. One way this manifests, a uh, side effect of sorts, really, is in the way Lady Dustin speaks to Roos. It's, it's actually kind of interesting, and, and it might sneak by. I certainly, I didn't notice the first few times I went through the book. If you reread Dance, though, take note of how she just seems to ignore his titles and speaks without any hint of deference, which is something that pretty much no one else can do around Roos. Uh, it's not something we can really capture in a single quote, so we'll just plant that seed and let you catch it yourself later. Mm -hmm. Roos is always lording over people gently, but deathly sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lady Barbary just calls him Roos and speaks bluntly, and this is in contrast to, as he says, how basically everyone else talks to him. Yeah, it's very interesting. She's powerful and she knows it. Roos decided first to consolidate political power at Barrowton, and this is kind of significant. The town is significant because it has accessible, it is an accessible central area for Roos to assemble and the Dustins themselves are the most important allies to Bruce Bolton. Dustin military strength is more intact than most, as Lady Dustin sent a bare minimum with Rob. Her town is crucial to Bolton for another reason as well. It provides supplies, something that Bruce needs badly in order to secure the North logistically. 
but it also provides a good central area for Roos to make his demands on the rest of the northern lords. Come to Barriton, bring hostages, swear fealty to the Iron Throne, accept me as warden of the north, you'll be accepted back into the king's peace. However, there's another consideration to talk about as well. Barriton's mm -hmm. attitude depends heavily on Lady Dustin's grudge. What if something yeah. happens to Lady Dustin? Her death could completely flip that situation upside down, though we have no idea who the heir to Barrington is at the moment. That's probably not very likely, though. So for now, House Dustin should, will likely remain loyal to the Boltons. Yeah, and, and the same goes for Lady Barbary's house of birth, which is House Riswell. Now, outside of House Frey and his own men, House Riswell seems the most loyal to Roose Bolton. The Riswells join with Ramsay Bolton to take Moat Kalen from the north, uh, one of Lord Riswell's sons is even named Roos. Uh, Roos's second wife was Bethany Riswell. However, there are cracks in this alliance. Ramsay Bolton uh, allegedly murdered Roos Bolton's heir, Domeric Bolton, and Domeric was Bethany Riswell's son. Yeah, so clearly that's a really big problem for Roos Bolton. The Riswells in general despise Ramsay Snow or Bolton. Yeah, by any name, <laughs> they <Right>. despise him. <laughs> Interestingly, they may have an issue with Ned Stark as well. Sir Mark Riswell died fighting the Kingsguard at the Tower of Joy. Mark's, with William Dustin. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Mark's relationship to the current Lord, Roderick Riswell, is unknown, but they must be kin uh, in some yeah, way. Some uh, certainly, Kingsguard is pretty prestigious. You'd think he'd be at least somewhat related to the Lord. Right. <laughs> but uh, the Riswells lost men at the Red Wedding, too, but uh, like others, they hold the phrase not Roos, responsible for their losses. Outwardly, anyway. So, uh, but Roos married a Frey. Yeah, he married her before the Red Wedding, but it obviously doesn't look great. So let's talk about those Freys who don't look great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, none of them. <laughs> we've given them... Uh, we've given them... All right. <laughs> yeah. Stoats, uh, ferrets, weasel face, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Assholes. So, <laughs> <laughs> We've given the phrase their own episode as well, so you should check that out. Um, we don't want to, again, I want to cover ground we've already covered, but there are some very specific things about the phrase that we want to break down as far as how it pertains to this situation. Uh, House Frey of the Twins is Roose Bolton's staunchest ally, as we said, outside of his own Dreadfort men, and yeah, with the Dustin and Riswell men, it's close. Uh, but but as we said, those people all hate each other. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they have a very large continuum of troops at Winterfell, and though they contribute this large manpower to the Bolton cause, uh, their presence is still very contentious among the other northern lords. Roos has some cover for his actions at the Twins, but the phrase just don't. You yeah. know, tell the story about Rob turning into a wolf and them attacking him. It's just Great all cover. ridiculous. Great yeah. cover. <laughs> Yeah. You know, obviously the, the Red Wedding resulted in the phrase and Bolton switching sides to the Lannisters, but the alliance may not last as, as long as there is nothing binding the Boltons and Lannisters together. But, However, at the moment, though, the Boltons and Freys are bound by marriage. Um, Walter Frey's primary motivation throughout the series is to advance his family standing among the older noble families in Westeros. Many of the old noble families of Westeros view the Freys as upjunked toll collectors who rose to power only on account of their, of their bridge athwart the Green Fork. One of the windfalls, though, of the defection is that Walder is able to marry his sons and daughters off to the most powerful houses of Westeros, and thus he's able to establish himself in some of the bloodlines for these major and older northern households. Um, and for, for instance, um, besides Roose Bolton, he marries off, um, is able to marry daughters and betrothed daughters to Davin and Lancel Lannister, so he establishes yeah. himself in the West. Yeah, of course, there's also the situation with the Tullys and River Run. He really did spread around a lot. He really is... The spread fray the fingers seed. are creeping uh, all over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the marriage to uh, Fat Walda to, to, to Roos, who is, of course, warden of the North and possibly king, if, if we consider his ambitions, that is, of course, a huge coup for uh, Lord Walder. Yeah, it's really crucial to the Frey ambitions for the Dreadfort and the North in general, and these ambitions with, that the Freys have are in conflict with Ramsay's ambitions. Right. Remember that Ramsay was still a Snow when Roos took Fat Walda as his wife. The expectations from the Freys at the time of that marriage must have been that any kids Roos has with Fat Walda, they would be the ones who inherit the dread for it. Walda writes to Roos, I pray for you, morn, noon, and night, my sweet lord. And <laughs> my count sweet the, lord. Yeah, sweet lord. Jeez. And count the days until you share my bed again. 
Return to me soon, and I will give you many true-born sons to take the place of your dear Domeric and rule the Dreadfort after you. By the way, I saw a really funny theory recently that mm -hmm. was uh, someone thought that Waldo's letters were written for from Tywin. <laughs> Picture Tywin writing, my, my dear, I pray for you more noon and night on the pink paper. <laughs> it's all pink. That's amazing. That's just ridiculous. Horrifying. Horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so, given that Ramsey Bolton was sort of elevated above their plans after these plans were put in place, uh, they didn't foresee this legitimization of Ramsey, obviously, and they could easily feel cheated. Now, if there's one thing we've learned in A Song of Ice and Fire is you do not want to cheat the phrase in America. <laughs> so, this ends up a pro this sets up a problem between the two of the least popular uh, in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. So, as much as everyone hates the phrase, the most hated figure in the North is Ramsey. I won't call him Bolton. Screw that. Snow. <laughs> Ramsey Snow. Come and get me, Ramsey. Uh, everyone who hates the phrase hates Ramsey for worse deeds in many cases. And yeah, the phrase, right. them, and, and not only that, the phrase themselves also hate Ramsey. Well, not outwardly, perhaps, but they certainly have major reason to, as, we will, uh, as we've begun to reveal and we will continue to. Uh, Roos has his own way of putting it. If she pops out suns the way she pops in tarts, <laughs> the dread fort will soon be overrun with Boltons. <laughs> Ramsey will kill them all, of course. That's for the best. I will not live long enough to see a new sons to manhood, and boy lords are the bane of any house. That's for the best. This guy, I swear. <laughs> what Surely a Lord Walder is aware of this, as we know the stories about Ramsey have to spread far and wide, even in the south. By king's decree, you are now a Bolton. Try and act like one. Tales are told of you, Ramsey. I hear them everywhere. People fear you. Good. You are mistaken. It is not good. Tales were ever never told of me. Do you think I would be sitting here if it were otherwise? Lord Walter would have warned his kin of all of this before he sent them north, uh, if they hadn't figured it out with themselves. Uh, having little Walter as his squire, uh, Ramsey's, it won't fool anyone as to what uh, Snow would do if his inheritance were threatened. And now that that, uh, that boy is dead anyway, after all. But Big Walter is Ramsey's squire as well. Could he be a spy for the other phrase? Hmm. It's, it's kind of unclear how much Ramsey trusts uh, Little Walter with, or Big Walter. But he does probably know about Brandon Rickon. So the phrase, uh, if they don't have all the secret information, they certainly are very clear on what Ramsey is capable of. Ramsey is also uh, another thing that, like, pisses people off. They're yeah. like, what's, what's the deal with that? Uh, Ramsey is constantly presuming titles, calling himself Lord of Everything, even in front of everyone at the wedding. Ramsey of House Bolton, Lord of Hornwood, heir to the Dreadford. I claim her. Who gives her? Meanwhile, Roos is not fully backing Ramsey's claim to the, dr claim to the Dreadford. It seems more that Roos intends for Ramsey to have the Hornwood and or Winterfell as his seat. He would have his newly pregnant wife's children inherit the dread for him. Or that's what he wants the phrase to believe, anyhow. Typical ruthless genius type, lying to everyone, stoking their expectations. He even says, you see what Ramsey is. She made him, her and Reek, always whispering in his ear about his rights. He should have been content to grind corn. Does he truly <laughs> think that he can ever rule the North? Uh, Ramsey is quite uh, notably not included in Roos's war councils or in the murder investigation. Mm -hmm. Roos doesn't seem to show trust for Ramsay in front of the other lords. The real simple fact of the matter is that too many lords can't stomach the thought of Ramsay as their liege lord. And Roos knows this. The lord of the Dreadfort is, is that now. He's the, the warden of the north, um, not the lord of Winterfell. Dustin, Lord Manderley, the Freys, the Riswells, none of them would accept him. And this is essentially the list of the most powerful individuals and lords involved in the struggle in the North. It would suit Roos well enough if Ramsay died, though not if it happened before he got a child on Arya. He asks Theon. Tell me, my lord, if the Kinslayer is accursed, what is a father to do when one son slays another? Yeah, he's basically telling, he's basically saying he can't be the one to kill Ramsay, him being Roos as a Kinslayer curse is probably worse even than the curse of having Ramsay as your son. <laughs> At least that's how, how, how Roos seems to see it. This could certainly happen on its own, say, in a battle. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so in this episode, we've gone into length on houses and hopefully shown the complexity behind the northern plotline from A Dance of Dragons. The politics alone could account for three to four episodes. But we hope we've shown the intricate details aren't exactly extra or unimportant but they're rather integral to how the Winds of Winter will likely play out. 
So, keep all this in mind as we uh, move on to our next two episodes in the coming weeks and as we turn to actual battle analysis and speculation. Interviewed recently, recently on The Winds of Winter, George R. R. Martin had this to say, I think we're going to start out with a big smash with the two enormous battles. <laughs> Martin's... Oh, that was redundant? Uh, presumably, one of those battles refers to this clash between Ramsey's army and Stannis' forces in the north. You would think so. It should be early in the book. Um, but in, since we have... Who knows how long till the book comes out. We'll just have to keep playing with it and <laughs> figuring out and speculating and all that. So we're going to leave part one with some quotes to embiggen your soul and tease what is to come with regards to the battle itself. And by the way, thanks everyone for tuning in live. This is uh, our first live recording uh, that we've advertised in advance. It's a bit of an experiment. Part of the reason we had it at a kind of an uh, admittedly inconvenient time was because we haven't done this before. We wanted to not necessarily expose it to a massive audience, not knowing how it would go, but things seem to have gone 100. well. We have 100 viewers right now. We've That's had 100 That's pretty true. much the whole we, uh, time, so more oh, than wow. we thought. Um, but the next, the, the part two and part three we'll plan to have, um, hopefully on a Saturday or a Sunday, at a time where people in a variety of time zones can hopefully tune in. We planned this one for 2 p.m. on a weekday, so people in <laughs> California and the East Coast can't tune in. Some people are up at 2 in the morning, as I saw in the comments. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to tune in. Hopefully mm -hmm. uh, there were no technical di difficulties on your end. <laughs> yeah, it's, it seems to have gone smoothly, so we'll, we'll keep doing this as long <laughs> as it uh, keeps working. So mm -hmm. let's let's get to those quotes I talked about. Theon, This one is Theon summarizing Roos's ultimate position. It's a really great quote. It kind of encapsulates uh, what Roos is looking at. He needs an end to this. The castle was too crowded to withstand a long siege, and too many of the lords here were of uncertain loyalty. Fat Wyman Mannerly, Horace Bay Number, the men of House Hornwood, and House Tallheart, the Locks and Flints and Riswells, all of them were Northmen, sworn to House Stark for generations beyond count. It was the girl who held them here, Lord Eddard's blood. But the girl was just a mummer's ploy, a lamb in a direwolf's skin. So why not send the Northmen foot forth to battle? Stannis, forth to battle before Stannis, before the force unraveled. Slaughter in the snow, and every man who falls is one less foe for the Dreadfort. And sure enough, here is the Lord of the Dreadfort giving out orders. Sir Hostine, assemble your knights and men at arms by the main gates. As you are so eager for battle, you shall strike our first blow. Lord Wyman, gather your White Harbor men by the east gate. They shall go forth as well. And then the mistrust shows itself, foreshadowing potential conflict, which will be a central theme of Part 2, along with the Battle of Ice itself. The Frey men wore the badge of the two towers. Those from White Harbor displayed Merman and Trident. They shouldered through the storm in opposite directions and eyed each other warily as they passed. But no swords were drawn. Not here. It may be different out there in the woods. So... That's it. That's, That's it for today, episode. folks. Um, we we'll can, uh, look out for an announcement of part two. Thanks uh, again, Jeff, for being here. And yeah, Jeff, so. it was a blast. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I can't <laughs> wait to get to part two and three. Yep. Yes. So, folks, uh, give us some feedback on this format. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the advantages of us being able to put this out like this is it gets up to YouTube faster. We uh, spend hours and hours of uploading time, and the live recording it just puts it straight up to YouTube. So yes. that okay. also helps cuts back on our uh, turnaround time of the episode being released. So uh, be sure to, yeah, like, like we said, comment, leave us feedback. Um, we'll be posting this over to Reddit. Um, head on over there and upvote it if, you're, if you, if you uh, frequent uh, that uh, <laughs> subreddit. As uh, Jeff mentioned, uh, he's a moderator there, uh, so you might have seen him there if you frequent it there. And also, check, yeah. check out his wars and politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, check out Jeff's blog. Yeah, yeah. You didn't. You got, did you uh, give you, give people the address for that? Oh, it's uh, well, it's brendanbeefish.wordpress.com, and the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit is reddit.com/r/asoif. Um, we have a lot of fun there. Um, come and join us. You get to find out all about Euron and Benjen's secret identity and all those <laughs> fun things that make us the kind of site that we are. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good time. It's a good times over there. Okay, everybody. Uh, Valor Morgulis, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>